In the vast world of Jujutsu Kaisen, very few characters match the level of physical might that is gained with a completed heavenly restriction. Disaster class curse spirit, sorcerers with the most broken curse techniques in the entire series, and even the King of Curses himself have all been forced to pay respect to the power that characters like these wield. And in this video, I wanted to see how far we could push the envelope. While in the anime, Toji's limitations have been made rather clear, we haven't seen how dangerous he could be if paired with another character built exactly like him. Him. So in this video, I'll be pairing Maki and Toji together as the Heavenly Restriction duo and putting them through the Special Grade Sorcerer Gauntlet to really test their limits. How they fare against these Special Grades and why will be answered in this video, so grab a seat as we dive into Toji and Maki versus every Special Grade Sorcerer. Starting this list off as light as possible, we have the sorcerer who has faced Toji before in the past, Suguru Geto. Now when it comes to Geto scaling, I actually think that he's slightly underrated by the community because of his rather short stay as an antagonist in Volume 0, but the little that we do get from him is pretty impressive. Not only is he shown to be capable of handling 2v1 situations with proficiency when dealing with both Yuta and Rika, but he's actually shown to have an advantage against Akotsu for a majority of the fight, only really showing signs of struggle after Yuta lands a black flag and decides to sacrifice his life and bond with Rika for victory. Yuta's physical abilities at this point are rather ambiguous, but Ghetto being able to keep up with and block the attacks of Rika at this point is very impressive considering how powerful she is gassed up to be. Later in the manga, we see that she's capable of restraining Yuji while partially manifested and even palming granite blasts from Ishigori when assisting Yuta in combat. This version of Rika is inferior in both cursed energy amounts and soul potency when compared to the version fought by Ghetto, so it's very fair to assume that she's overall a weaker her spirit with less to offer in battle physically. He also just shares all of Kenjaku's scaling due to them possessing the same base physical vessel and cursed energy, as observed by Gojo, and nothing in the story has contradicted this idea yet. Kenjaku is shown to be able to absolutely trounce Choso and Piercing Blood in every regard, meaning that Ghetto should be able to perform these feats at least on a similar level as well. Relativity to Yuki and speed and reaction time is also given Ghetto by the way of Kenjaku's scaling, so all in all, it seems that Ghetto is no slouch in close quarters. Kenjaku also states that Yuta would have been smoked back in Volume 0 if Ghetto hadn't split his forces, and if you take this statement with any level of seriousness, it only adds to Ghetto's scaling and reinforces his validity as an opponent. On top of all of this bodily power, in his prime, Ghetto was able to summon up to 6,000 cursed spirits to wield at his discretion, so he certainly won't be outnumbered by the likes of these two invisible people. Suguru is certainly impressive, but even individually, Toji and Maki have consistent scaling that shows that they'd be above him in general physicality. Due to being able to wipe out the Zenin clan at any moment they chose, Toji and Maki must at least be relative to Naobito in speed. Naobito is stated to be second only to Gojo when using projection sorcery, and obviously, that means that characters like Ghetto would be below that. Even if you wanted to say that this only applies to characters who would currently be alive in the story, the fact that this is made clear by the narrator when Kenjaku and Yuki are alive within the context of Jujutsu Kaisen demonstrates that Ghetto wouldn't be an exception to this statement at all. Later in the manga, Maki goes on to absolutely decimate Curse Naoya, who is implied to have maximized the potential for projection sorcery and as such, surpassed Naobito. With precognition and her own physical strength and speed, Maki is able to avoid just about every attack he tries and beats him with ease. And with Ghetto having to face not one, but two characters of this caliber, let's just say he won't have a good time if he allows them to get close. This fact leaves him with only one option, zone the hell out of them with cursed spirits. And honestly, this strategy would work for a little bit, if only because of the sheer amount of bodies that he'd be able to throw at them. However, Toji and Maki would have very little trouble working their way through the curses in large chunks, at least if given enough time. Both of them wield a blade that allows for the cleaving of anything in any one regardless of its durability, and Toji has the inverted spear plus chain of a thousand miles to mow through the crowd at a distance as well. Pair all of that with their ability to simply disappear from the battlefield at a moment's notice, and it's only a matter of time until Ghetto gets caught by an attack that he simply doesn't have the ability to defend against. Durability wise, Toji and Maki can also take quite a few hits if they mess up as well. Toji's shown the ability to defend against things as strong as Red if he reacts in time with the inverted spear, and Maki has shown us that she can straight up eat a punch from Sukuna, albeit a vaguely weakened one, so I honestly wouldn't say that either character is at risk of death when fighting against someone who's unlikely to land more than a few lucky hits. Suguru Geta would push them to mid difficulty for sure, if only because of how many cursed spirits he'd be able to throw at them at once, but at the end of the day, Toji and Maki would have this in the bag. 
Yuki Tsukumo is next up on the list, unfortunately only meeting the specimen that she once wanted to study through the field of battle. Now unlike Ghetto, we don't really have to bother scaling Yuki's speed in depth because she's just relative to him in that department based on the Kenjaku line of scaling. In terms of raw striking strength though, there is quite the disparity between Yuki, Ghetto, and basically everyone else on this list barring Gojo and Tsukuna. While the upper limits of her physical strength are kind of ambiguous to us, she has shown that she can tear off both of Kenjaku's arms arms with a single punch and one shot a special grade curse with Garuda, so it's safe to say that she hits like a freight train even when talking about Toji and Maki as the opponent. Now while Garuda doesn't have enough AP feats to really let us know if they can one shot Toji and Maki in the same way it does the Ganesha curse, it's pretty fair to say that Yuki landing a clean blow on either one of them means death or at the bare minimum limb loss, at least if Yuki's at full strength. See, Yuki's kind of interesting when it comes to her potency with Star Rage because it seems like even one use of RCT or extensive damage in general makes her attacking power power pitiful in comparison to her prime. Even after fully healing her body, Kenjaku is able to shrug off a couple of attacks hitting him in the face, starkly contrasting the monstrous power that she demonstrated before. I bring this fact up because Honestly, Yuki isn't landing a hit on Toji and Maki without taking quite a bit of damage herself first. I already established that both of these characters scale significantly above Yuki's caliber of speed, and when you pair that fact with two weapons that can essentially one-shot her durability, you have a very, very serious problem for Sakumo. Yuki can technically do the same thing to them back with Star Rage imbued punches, but she has a disadvantage in speed, plus her opponents have precognition, as well as the ability to essentially disappear from her cursed energy senses. Garuda helps Yuki avoid a complete jump jutsu kaisen session, but it isn't as autonomous of an ally as Maki or Toji respectively, meaning that it's eventually going to be dealt with in some form or fashion. Kenjaku was able to be held down temporarily by Garuda in his fight with Yuki and Choso, but even while his mobility was limited, he was capable of avoiding Choso's piercing blood plus the combined efforts of a fatigued Choso and Yuki. Both characters going up against Yuki now are significantly more competent in a physical fight than Kenjaku, and she doesn't have the benefit of being able to jump them individually. So more more than likely, whoever is dealing with Garuda will be able to exercise the curse or at least get rid of it in any meaningful capacity in order to join their other against Yuki. Assuming that she can heal from Soul Split Katana attacks, her punches after using RCT would become ineffectual enough relative to her previous output, so much so that Toji and Maki would have nothing to worry about. Now this isn't to say that Yuki without Star Rage at maximum capacity is super weak, rather that feat-wise it just isn't enough to argue that it's blowing through Toji and Maki's durability in the way that I I would be able to before. Now, while I already established that both physically gifted warriors are faster than her, even if you do make the case that she's going to land hits on them, at least somewhat, it would only be after a technique is halted by the inverted Spear of Heaven or sustaining damage from some other cursed tool that would lower her own cursed energy output. Her domain expansion also doesn't work as a trump card here because her opponent can simply choose to ignore it if need be. In fact, if Yuki does have her domain open at any point in this fight, only to have the barrier shattered, her chances of winning sink even further due to cursed technique burnout. While I think that Maki and Toji would have to be careful to not get hit early on in the battle, the fact that Yuki would primarily confront them on turf that they have the explicit advantage on means that they would secure a win with relative ease. Now, Ghetto wasn't happy about getting his ass kicked by Toji again, so his body gets to run back here with Kenjaku piloting the ship. And while Kenny is unambiguously stronger than Ghetto due to his extra curse techniques, RCT, and domain expansion, the result of the battle is strikingly similar to what I described before. The amount of curse spirits that he has in his possession is ambiguous, but even assuming that he has the same quantity that Ghetto had with a few more notable special grades like the Ganesha curse spirit, Toji's ability to cancel techniques like that out via the spear makes it a rather moot point. RCT would allow Kenjaku to prolong this battle more than Ghetto, but up against two people physically superior to him with one-shot curse tools, all this would be doing is extending his beat down. The domain expansion also wouldn't work on them, just due to it not targeting inanimate objects like Sukuna's, leaving gravity as his last and most effective secondary option. I think it's fair to assume that the technique would be effective on the two despite their physical strength, but Yuki viewed the regen intervals as very exploitable even with her reaction times and strength, so with extra speed, extra hand, and precognition, I don't see either of these two being unable to exploit this weakness, especially if they are tag teaming with maximum efficiency. I'd certainly say that this is their hardest battle to date, but Toji and Maki would still be able to seal the deal in the end.
The prodigious young special grade is up next, and much like the characters I've put Maki and Toji up against before, Yuta is going to have a really, really hard time facing up against these two in a physical confrontation, meaning that he's going to have to rely very much so on his hacks and variety of abilities. While he isn't a slouch in the physical department, his best feats are based on him cooking Yuji, going blow for blow with Ishigori up close, and kind of blitzing Kenjaku depending on your interpretation of this scene. Regardless, Yuta still doesn't want to be dealing with Toji and Maki up close with no backup, and this is where Rika comes in. Even when only partially manifested, it is clear that Rika is very powerful, completely immobilizing Yuji while not taking the whole situation seriously, but this isn't enough for someone with a complete heavenly restriction. If Yuta smart, he'll unleash every bit of his power pretty early on and try to split Toji and Maki up so that he can deal with them individually. Unlike Garuda, I do think that Rika has enough autonomy and strength to at least provide Yuta with some time to breathe and recoup, but with either Toji or Maki right up on him, things don't look good good regardless. Cursed speech would be essential in Akotsu keeping them at bay, and sky manipulation might just be the ability he needs when going up against opponents who like to keep things close, but even those two curse techniques would only work as a stopgap to keep Akotsu alive a little bit longer. With no domain expansion on the table, Yuta wouldn't be able to take control of the area, resulting in him being pressured for the entirety of his 5 minute timer. I do think that through hit and run tactics, his multitude of curse techniques, massive well of cursed energy and RCT, Yuta would be able to survive against both of them for 5 minutes, but he wouldn't be able to do much more against them than this, and once that timer is up, his cursed energy reserves go down and his techniques are restricted once more, it'll only be a matter of time before Yuta gets sliced and diced. And as a little bit of a bonus round before moving on to the strongest sorcerers alive, Kenji Hakari stands. I know that in terms of official ranking, he doesn't hold the special grade title, but the story pretty consistently compares Akotsu and Hakari, and Yuta has even said that Hakari is stronger than him when worked up, so in terms of power, he isn't a crazy person to put on the list. Now, when it comes to Kenji, he's very similar to Akotsu in the sense that his base form gets obliterated by these two. His best feat in base is beating up on a Yuji who was resolved not to fight back, but even if you were to say that he's vaguely stronger than this version of Itadori, it wouldn't be enough to go up against these two monsters. It's primarily through his domain expansion that Hikari becomes the powerhouse that he's hyped up to be, and while I'll talk about Jackpot Hikari against those two in a second, I actually first wanted to address the possibility of him actually landing his Jackpot technique against Toji and Maki. The reason I doubt the efficacy of Idle Death Gamble in this specific scenario is simply due to the nature of rule-based domain expansions and how they interact with Heavenly Restriction types. In Chapter 164, it is made clear by Tengen that rule-based domains take effect by having their sure hit technique force the opponent to abide by a set of rules and regulations. However, the binding vow is that these rules must be explained in full in order for the barrier's technique to take effect. Higuruma typically does this verbally, but due to the complexity of the rules and the sheer amount of them, Kari's domain injects the information into his opponent as a part of its sure hit ability, fulfilling the binding vow and starting the round simultaneously, which is likely part of the reason his domain is able to open so quickly. The problem when facing Toji and Maki though, is that they can't be targeted by sure hit techniques, at least not Hikari's, which means that the domain's effect will be inert due to the lack of explanation. Now, Hikari could technically just verbally explain the rules to them, but not only would he likely not immediately detect what's going on, but due to the verbose nature of Idle Death Gamble, he'd have a lot of explaining to do before he can start rolling, and as I established before, Hikari in base isn't even worth discussing when talking about fighting Toji and Maki individually, much less them working together as a dynamic duo. This is all well and good, but it's not what the people want to see when discussing Hikari versus really anybody. So even assuming that Hikari does land a jackpot, it's tough to say that he does all that well. In my opinion, the overall outcome doesn't change that much. Don't get me wrong, he performs significantly better against them in this form, and I even think that they'd struggle to kill him due to the speed of his healing, but Hikari just doesn't have anything in his arsenal capable of ending Toji and Maki, and on top of this, he'd also be in danger of having his technique stopped by the inverted Spear of Heaven. Assuming he isn't defeated within those 4 minutes and 11 seconds though, Hikari just gets trounce the moment he's killable once again. Assuming Akari never gets on a roll, Toji and Maki negative diff him. If he is able to land a jackpot, then they mid diff him. Unfortunately, Toji and Maki's next opponent won't be going down so easily. In fact, Gojo Satoru is probably going to be the last thing either of these characters ever see. These physically gifted warriors do have the benefit of wielding the inverted spear of heaven, meaning that they can get past infinity if need be, and they are also immune to Gojo's domain expansion, which is good because in most versus battles, that's usually an instant win in his 
Gojo's favor. What's not so good is the fact that Gojo beats these two in just about everything else besides that. In terms of speed, Gojo is far beyond Naobito's capabilities, meaning that Toji and Maki scaling above Naobito as well is a moot point. In hidden inventory, Gojo was able to dodge Toji's attacks up close completely, and while Toji was considered rusty himself and mentally nerfed due to his own internal conflict, Gojo at this stage of his life is much weaker than the sorcerer they are facing today. Even if you were to lowball the hell out of Gojo and say that he's relative to both characters in physical speed, his teleportation would make all the difference in how that speed is specifically utilized. Strength-wise, Gojo definitely should be able to deal out some crazy damage to them as well, especially when you consider the fact that casual punches from him when enhancing his attacks with blue makes Yuta and Hikari vomit. He's also strong enough for Arame to feel the pain of his attacks an entire month after the hit, and Tsukuna can be damaged by these blows pretty extensively himself. Spawning multiple blue points on their limbs to mangle them, Curse Technique Reversal Red and Hollow Purple are also within Satoru's arsenal, allowing him to neutralize the threat of these two up close or at range if he deems it necessary. Maki and Toji are strong, but as of right now, they aren't strong enough to beat the most powerful sorcerer of the modern day. This goes double for Tsukuna, who has all of the physical scaling that Gojo does, plus world splitting dismantles, plus attacks that adjust to durability, plus general invisible slashes, plus a fire arrow to go along with it. Tsukuna in his true form even has the extra limbs to deal with Toji and Maki jumping him at close range. If that wasn't enough, things go from bad to worse when you remember that Tsukuna has a domain capable of targeting inanimate objects like Toji and Maki, and thus Malevolent Shrine can take them off the board. If the two were somehow durable enough to survive that entire onslaught, Slot, one fire arrow in the midst of the domain sure hit attacks would be on speed dial to end the fight in a blaze of glory. These two characters make their way through a majority of the special grade level combatants talked about in today's video, but unsurprisingly, the strongest sorcerer in history and the strongest sorcerer of the modern era are enough to stop them in their tracks. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more gauntlet style content like it, check out this one where I pit Yuji and Toto against every special grade curse spirit. Subscribe for more content like this, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.